All right. So we're on page 157 and I'm going to read from the book. If anybody does still want to kind of get hold of these books, you can, because we have all the recordings previously. Um, so you can catch up with that. But otherwise, uh, it's not really necessary. We're just going to read it out and then have some discussion as well. So um, <clears throat> last week, we went through lots of different uh, uh, laudable and not very laudable qualities that may arise in all of us from time to time, and uh, particularly looked at the ones around views and holding on to them tenaciously, relinquishing them with difficulty as a cause for um, disharmony in community, and also describing how we can be happy and glad when we do see that we are free from such things and there is something to still be done we can still train and we can feel happy about it we can look at ourselves in the mirror and see in this simile that our face is clean and we can um, continue the practice having confidence that it's effective so today we're on settling disputes between the laity and the sangha so even between the laity and the sangha disputes can arise um, and they're not always from the laity either. Sometimes there can be certain members who are ordained, who are human beings, who have all kinds of uh, wily minds. And uh, we'll get onto that soon. So the first one is quite a provocative one. And uh, yes, I will discuss it as we go. So it's called Overturning the Arms Bowl. And it's from the Anguttara 8, number 8 to 7. <laughs> So normally I um, change the word monks to be the monastics or community. But in this case, it's um, very much refers to the monastics because they're the only ones who have arms bowls. So I'll just say monastics there. Monastics, when a lay follower possesses eight qualities, the sangha, that means the monastic sangha, if it so wishes, may overturn the arms bowl on them. What eight qualities they try to prevent monastics from acquiring gains number two they try to bring harm to monastics number three they try to prevent monastics from residing nearby number four they insult and revile monks i'm saying they here to make it gender neutral Number five, they divide monastics from each other. Number six, they speak dispraise of the Buddha. Number seven, they speak dispraise of the Dhamma. And number eight, they speak dispraise of the Sangha. When a lay follower possesses these eight qualities, the Sangha, if it so wishes, may overturn the arms bowl on them. Monastics, when a lay follower possesses eight qualities, the Sangha, if it so wishes, may turn the arms bowl upright on them. What eight? They do not try to prevent monastics from acquiring gains. Number two, they do not try to bring harm to monastics. Number three, they do not try to prevent monastics from residing nearby. Number four, they do not insult and revile monks or monastics or bikinis. Number five, they do not divide monastics from each other. Number six, they speak praise of the Buddha. Number seven, praise of the Dhamma. Number eight, praise of the Sangha. When a lay follower possesses these eight qualities, the Sangha, if it so wishes, may turn the alms bowl upright on them. In other words, they may go for alms and receive food from such a person. So this is interesting, and I think the second half is obviously, um, hopefully, the norm, right? And it's a list of things that a person doesn't do. So it's not that a person has to be perfectly moral to um, to offer alms food to monastics, because obviously uh, one of the um, the roles of the sangha is to give people an opportunity to um, perform generous deeds to support those who teach them the dhamma, because we can't handle money as monastics especially fully ordained monastics. Um, but we do earn our livelihood, if you like, from um, being good examples and practicing the path. And that livelihood is basically our arms bowl. 
um, you know, we have to eat and also have a place to dwell. So there's these four requisites that are, um, are offered by the lay community, the food, the lodgings, the medicine, and also the robes. So if we don't have a robe to wear, we can't really continue in the monastic life. If we don't have somewhere to reside, in England anyway, we'd be very cold and wet. <laughs> in India, it was easier to kind of wander and sleep under the root of a tree or in a little kind of shed or by a bale of hay. And these are uh, lots of examples of this in the suttas. But obviously these days, and especially in uh, countries that are colder, that doesn't really work. So um, it is part and parcel of the... Uh, of the way that the monastic sangha runs to live on alms food. And in many Buddhist countries, you can still see this being practiced. Uh, every morning, usually even before the sun rises in places like Myanmar, where it's very, very hot, um, they start to go on alms round. As soon as the sun starts to come up, you know, they might chant uh, some metta phrases and establish themselves in mindfulness. And then with the ball turned the right way, around turned upright they'll go on this arms round through even the poorest of villages and uh, it's very very touching to see this happen and especially to see those villagers come out you know wearing their best clothes and cooking fragrant rice and just putting a spoon in the bowl with utmost humility and respect for the sangha it's very beautiful and these are people with nearly nothing you know who give best better food in fact to the monastics perhaps than they eat themselves um, just out of that faith and devotion in the Sangha. But obviously, um, in the beginning here, there's an example of somebody who's actually not well-intentioned in giving alms food. And so that may seem a little controversial to some, you know. I know that some people sometimes say, well, shouldn't we give everybody an opportunity? Because surely it's uh, meritorious for somebody to do even a little bit of generosity. But um, there are occasions when it may not be the case. And uh, one such occasion was actually in Myanmar again. This is where I ordained um, in 2006, was it? 2006. And I spent the first four to five years of my monastic life there. Um, and at that time, I mean, certainly the country was under very heavy military rule, um, but things were peaceful at the time, on the surface, at least. And uh, sadly, at the beginning, I think of 2000, I think it was the year 2000, that there was a, a horrible um, military coup, basically, and which has turned into a genocide. And, um, and the people in Myanmar did resist. And they tried to resist peacefully. And one of the forms of peaceful resistance that they, they um, did was to actually overturn the arms ball on some of the military supporters or the military, let's say. I mean, many of these people are actually victims themselves. They've been, um, you know, kind of rounded up from poor villages as young adults or, you know, without much of an education, maybe their families are really poor and they don't have a lot of choice. If they don't actually uh, join, they may be threatened, even killed or just disappear. You know, there's lots of um, young men just healthy, fit, perhaps well-educated, who get put in prison even at the time I was there for what my teacher would call petty crime, things like being in a casino, just ordinary things that teenagers might do, and they'd just be uh, put away because the military wanted to take away all the intelligence, hmm? all the young, the youth's energy and, um, and brains <laughs> and just uh, incarcerate them, put them to labour in some sort of service working on roads or whatever. So yeah, this was one of the uh, protests that uh, the people did. And one of my friends, Venerable Vimala, she's a, or they are a bikini in, um, in Belgium. They decided to do a little campaign over here as well. And uh, they gathered together photographs of monastics in the West mostly, but I think all over the world, um, taking a photograph of them with the bowl turned upside down and, I think I was included in that. So um, it's a very, very strong statement in a Buddhist country. I don't know, for those who are Sri Lankan here, have you ever seen that? I doubt you've ever seen that happen in your country. And I don't know what you might think of it, but, you know, there are corrupt um, 
lay followers or people doing terrible things. And then perhaps they come to the Sangha to sort of almost cover it over, right? It might not actually be doing them much good, especially if they have bad intentions to divide the Sangha. And uh, here it's saying, you know, to divide the monastics from each other and to actually speak dispraise of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. So it's very questionable as to whether they're doing any good at all. So I don't know. Would anyone like to speak to that at all? I mean, I'd be curious to hear from anybody here, you, um, but especially perhaps those from Buddhist countries, um, what you made of that. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I'm coming to Susie. Hi, Venerable. Hello. Um, I just thought, you know, like, I think it's just really beautiful how, like, in some countries, there's there's so much support for monastics, um, regardless of, like, because, you know, like, how we don't really know them as people, but, like, there's so many monastics in that country and they're all getting so much support. It's it's really beautiful. That's all what I just wanted to say. It's really beautiful because um it's like coming together to to like unite and help the Sangha prosper. Mm. So yeah, I just wanted mm. to say that. It's really lovely. Mm. Yeah, that's the purpose, isn't it? To unite and help the Sangha prosper exactly for the sake of spreading the Dhamma and in a way it's very beautiful that you know it is an anonymous act and that's the purpose of a Sangha that nobody really stands out everybody looks the same so even though you might think I stand out and don't look the same as anyone in this room in Asia where I would belong really culturally um, I would disappear you know if there was an established Sangha of bikinis and it is happening in some countries everyone looks the same you can't tell really who's uh you know, practicing well, who's still, you know, got a ways to go. You c And this is intentional so that the gifts don't become kind of invested in any way. You know, some people think, oh, it's more meritorious if you give to an enlightened monastic. But actually, the Buddha said the most meritorious offering is one made to both sanghas, the female and the male sangha, the bhikkhuni and the bhikkhus. And these days, I think it's starting to include, you know, of course, gender non-binary people, but even uh, transgender people, we're trying to find ways for them to ordain. So it's supposed to be inclusive and, um, you know, not leave anyone out. So I think Ajahn Brahm once told this story about um, when he was a young monk and obviously Ajahn Chah was his teacher. He was very famous by then. And one day... I think on a Pasita day or a special day of some kind, they came to the monastery with extra special food in a van, you know, loads of it. And they got it all out. And then they asked, where's Ajahn Chah? And they said, oh, Ajahn Chah's not here today. And you know what they did? They put it all back <laughs> and they drove away. And these poor, young, skinny Western monks, they were so devastated. Oh, no. <laughs> Ajahn Chah's not here now. They don't care for us. And this is really not the right intention because it does kind of uh, suppose that, you know, we can tell where a person is on the path and also that the giving is not entirely pure. I mean, it's beautiful to support people who practice well. And we'll see in the next little reading that it's sometimes not a really um, praised or encouraged to support those who you know are not, you know, living virtuous lives. They're not even real ascetics. I mean, some of the things that... Um, monastics do in somebody's countries are just quite shocking and actually should constitute them being disrobed so they're actually not monastics anymore because some of the things they've done are disrobing offenses but they still walk around in the robes and in this kind of case you know you're not doing anyone any favors by supporting them but generally speaking the idea is that everybody has that potential to awaken and um, everybody who's in robes has at least taken a very deep step of renunciation so there's something there to to respect and that's one of the reasons we do refer to each other in the sangha as venerable um it was interesting today because a local friend came and uh, she's been in amravati quite a lot and there they call the nuns sister and the monks venerable it's the word bante but it basically means venerable so does the word ayah they're both the same word uh translated as venerable um, and I said, oh, it's it's actually venerable. 
And uh, she's not familiar with that because, of course, it's kind of nice to think we're all brothers and sisters, which is wonderful. But actually, I tried to explain that it's not a person that's venerable. It's the act of renunciation that is something worthy of veneration. And um, to me, the, the time that I've used this the most is toward other monastics who are either my equals in terms of seniority or even junior to me. As soon as somebody gets into even a seminary, a novice uh, monastic, in Perth anyway, we call them venerable. So even with venerable Upeka, she's a friend, right? So yeah, I could call her, hey, bod, but I don't. I call her venerable Upeka, <laughs> sometimes ven U. But it's just something really beautiful because it reminds us of uh, the renunciation that person took. So, yeah, it's important to treat the Sangha as a whole and to recognize that gifts given to both the bhikkhuni and bhikkhuni sangha are the highest benefit and merit. Tamali. Oh. Can you hear me? Can. Okay. <laughs> um, since you asked, Venerable, I thought I would just say, I have actually never seen the um, that act. Yeah. Uh, um, in in Sri Lanka, at least from my side, but sometimes you do see, you know, all these politicians going in and on news, you know, getting blessings, and then in the next minute you hear them, you know, um, the way they act, and sometimes you do like, you know, maybe not a good thought, but you do wish sometimes the monastics took a bit of a strict stand and express that <clears throat> I just wanted to share that yeah thanks yeah that everything that you know comes up um it's a, it's also such an amazing way of expressing there's no there's no physically you know it's such a strong mm -hmm. statement that in, expressed in a beautiful way that uh, yeah um without using words or anything you can actually say such a strong thing which I find it's really amazing yeah that's true isn't it it's um in a way quite a non-violent statement as well it's just a very simple gesture that like you say is quite powerful and very unexpected for somebody coming to offer arms so yeah I do think it's a monastic's duty to um address wrongdoing address you know a lack of virtue in the supporters, because that's one of the things we're supposed to speak to supporters about, it's supposed to speak to the lay community about in general. You know, sila, dana, sila, bhavana, isn't it? They're the three fundamentals. The first one is like generosity, and you're trying to give an opportunity for people to, to show that generosity, which can be done, you know, in all sorts of ways. Many people here probably might not have often supported the Sangha, but you might have supported other charitable causes. Um, and this is an act of generosity that supports your practice. It's a part of the virtue. It's starting to sort of see that your good, what is of benefit to you, is intimately connected and um, with the good of others. You know, the two are no different. And it brings us out of that self-centered kind of narrow mindedness that worries about me and mine. Um, and then the virtue as a whole means acts of body and speech that do bring people together so that's one of the reasons we're not supposed to get into politics because that by its nature can be quite divisive quite uh well money oriented a lot of the time power money control um so i don't think there's anything wrong around expressing principles you know and if you want to say that's political or it puts you in one party or another so be it but you know for me it's very clear that the buddha wanted uh an equitable society, as the next chapter sort of will discuss, but uh, us to look out for the underdogs as well, to look out and care for those who have less and to curb those tendencies of greed. So um, I do think it's very corrupting for the Sangha to be getting into politics. I mean, it's not just lay supporters in Sri Lanka. I think some Sangha members also actually get onto political parties, which is very different from, say, voting against Brexit, <laughs> which to me is a, a moral thing. Well, I mean, that's my opinion. And um, I think that's for the greater good. So, but to actually sit on political parties is not at all the job of a monastic. You know, that's why we go forth. We um, understand that there's only so much you can do in the world. And uh, what people are most in need of, or at least what we feel drawn to offer, is some sort of training for the mind. 
And I think we need people working at every level of society, but a monastic's role is very specific to that. Yeah. Liz. Me, I've got something to say about generosity. One day I was listening to a video made by a young monk in Thailand. Yeah. And he was saying, he's American, and uh, he was saying that before he became a monk, he used to put one dollar in a jar before he started meditating. And at the end of the month, he would go to the bank and put everything together and so on and send it to a charity of some kind. And that made me think, I mean, I do give quite a lot of money, sometimes a bit too much, but never mind. I thought, you know, it is this putting the money somewhere and thinking that will go and buy food or so. I uh, I do that, and uh, I send it to World Food Programs. They've got an app where you can send five, well, it's four euro ninety, uh, and that buys five meal for whatever cause, you know, Congo, Gaza, and so on and so forth. And I think it is such a lovely gesture. Uh, and it is, he said, before meditating, that puts you in the mood to meditate. Yes, no, no. And, and I thought that was absolutely lovely. And, and you sleep better as well when you're mm. generous, when you've yeah, sent yeah. money to the Gambia or whatever. <laughs> and you feel, you feel at peace with the world, don't yeah. you? Yeah, that's lovely. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned sleeping well because that's... Um, exactly what happens in uh in the practice of metta you know yeah. the, the metta is said to um create you know the ability to sleep deeply not to have bad dreams and to wake up refreshed and generosity is so close to that we have to have generosity in order to um in order to give uh, in order to have metta because metta is all about giving and sharing our lives our life energy so that's lovely and even to improve that sort of thing um, one of the things I'm going to be teaching on the New Year retreat in Sheffield is um, to reflect on our generosity at the beginning of the meditation or to reflect on any quality that we can really respect in ourselves. Um, it can be something that we've done, like give something directly to a certain group of people who are suffering or who need it or, you know, who you are inspired by or whatever it is. Um, but it could be so many things. It could be just, you know, being kind to someone that you normally get irritated with or uh, just restraining yourself or noticing that you're a little bit more patient today or, you know, you um, you didn't take the extra chocolate at lunchtime. You can do whatever, reflect in whatever way that just brings that kind of um, gladness and strength and encouragement to the mind and then the sealer goes even further. So, yeah, that's a really lovely um, reflection that you had. <laughs> Good. So shall we continue? Shall we continue with the next one or anything else to say on this? I guess it's a little bit out of most people's range of experience to have an arms bowl turned upside down on you. If that ever happens when you come here, then you know that you, <laughs> you need to shape up your act. <laughs> so just to say just to finish off by saying it's an extreme situation I mean I think all these eight have to probably be in place or a lot of them um and they're all quite extreme but interesting the one about insulting and reviling monastics I mean that can happen that can actually happen and I was wondering about that you know whether um <laughs> whether you, you know you'd you'd easily sort of refuse or whether that would be a fairly small thing. But then I was speaking earlier with Chi and she was saying that um, maybe part of this is that you don't over-associate with people who just bring a lot of harm and create a lot of trouble because that can be extremely exhausting and also maybe encourage it, maybe encourage that unwise association. So although um, I probably wouldn't be turning my arms bone on somebody, it may be the case. I wouldn't particularly want to invite them to the monastery, say, if they'd shown rude and aggressive behavior to me before, because um, a monastery is a place where people want to be inspired and people want to see, you know, the lived example of harmony to the best of our ability, but certainly not 
bad behavior that's destructive and divisive. So that might be another way to overturn the arms bowl is just not to receive a certain guest, right? Sometimes people do have to be asked to leave monasteries. And sometimes that can be the monastic themselves. So um, I would like to get onto that bit. I'll just go through the box because I think there's a funny comment there. <laughs> Someone saying then, when I first read Overturn the Arms Bowl, I imagined the monastics dumping a bowl of food on someone's head. <laughs> That's, <good. laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, it, it could sound like that. And yeah, Kim also <laughs> heard it that way. You know that story, I don't know if I should tell it, I've told it before, but there is a story about um, some bikinis dumping a bowl of something else on someone's head, something very smelly, because they had uh, done their business in a bucket, and this particular nun was very lazy, and she decided to just shove it over the wall, really high wall, and she couldn't see behind it, and of course, someone was walking the other side. So there's actually a rule that says um, bikinis... <laughs> If you put a bucket of mm, on someone's head, this is an uh, a, an offence to be confessed. <laughs> so the Buddha's very compassionate. You just have to tell someone that that's what you've done, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and hopefully you're told not to do it again. So uh, okay, good. So I'll carry on. So the next one is about a loss of confidence, and this is in the monastics. And my caveat here will be, please um, don't expect monastics to be perfect. Um, this is about ongoing behavior, and it's pretty much the same. So monastics, when a monastic possesses eight qualities, lay followers, if they wish, may proclaim their loss of confidence in them, in that monastic. What eight? That monastic tries to prevent lay people from acquiring gains. Number two, they try to bring harm to lay people. Number three, they insult and revile lay people. Number four, they divide lay people from each other. Number five, they speak dispraise of the Buddha. So this is already very odd as a monastic to do this. Number six, they speak dispraise of the Dhamma. Number seven, they speak dispraise of the Sangha. And number eight, they see him or them at an improper resort. Okay, so they're meeting them in the wrong kind of place. Maybe, I don't know, in a nightclub or a casino or something like that. So they're going somewhere that they shouldn't be going to receive these arms. When a monastic possesses these eight qualities, lay followers, if they wish, may proclaim their loss of confidence in them. Monastics, when a monastic possesses eight qualities, lay followers, if they wish, may restore their confidence in them. That's nice, isn't it? It's not just you either have it or you don't, but you can, it can be restored. <clears throat> what eight? This monastic does not try to prevent lay people from acquiring gains does not try to bring harm to lay people, does not insult and revile lay people, does not divide lay people from each other, speaks praise of the Buddha, speaks praise of the Dhamma, and speaks praise of the Sangha. And they see that lay person at a proper resort. When a monastic possesses these eight qualities, lay followers, if they wish, may restore their confidence in them. Hmm. I quite like that, actually, that it's about restoring, because that to me suggests that we're not judging a person. We're just looking at the behavior of that person at a particular time and behaviors can change. You know, it could be from night, from one day to the next. Who knows? Maybe one day the monastic is, you know, creating a big fuss and saying all kinds of terrible, divisive things. And the next day they pull themselves together. But I think generally speaking, this would be happening over a period of time because in both cases, whether it's the monastics or the lay people, it's a whole group of people who are deciding to overturn a bowl or who are deciding to um, profess a loss of confidence in a monastic. It's a whole group of people. So that also is an interesting point because uh, sometimes we might have a wrong judgment of others. Yeah? And I think certainly as a member of the Sangha, we do try to discuss things amongst ourselves and we try to come to a, a decision that's uh, 
ideally democratic and, and a majority consensus on, on any particular matter. And it's encouraged in the um in the Vinaya that uh you know if there isn't a consensus, maybe if there's say 22 bikunis, imagine that, and there are 20 four or so monks in Perth. So 22 bikunis who um, agree and then just one or two bikunis who, who who disagree with a particular decision. It's really good if those two who disagree can try and come on board, unless, of course, it's something ethical and it's something that's really fundamental to the holy life. And um, if one of those two happens to be the senior monastic, it's not necessary that they have to pull their, you know, kind of uh, have a louder voice, but... Ideally, you would respect the the ones with more wisdom, with more experience in any particular matter. So sometimes the democracy in a mature group of people um, happens almost uh, intuitively. So although, for example, Ajahn Brown might sometimes have uh, an opinion that's not that popular, generally speaking, people will respect his um, perspective. But sometimes he gets outvoted on little things, you know, like whether the monks should wear a shirt in the winter and things like that. <laughs> so sometimes the Sangha has the, the final say. And that's very beautiful too. And probably the same with lay followers because you'll always get one or two that, you know, decide that, you know, a monastic is uh, maybe not good enough to support or maybe they have a personal issue with a monastic and they might believe that they're, being rude when they're not or you know maybe they're sometimes right but when a few people in a whole lay community decide that then that has the monastic should really listen you know they should uh, be able to receive feedback and try to pull up their game <laughs> try to um make reparation and um abstain from a particular behavior um so that they can restore the faith of the laity again it's very destructive, actually, when that happens, because sometimes, I mean, it's like any group, isn't it? One person behaves badly and then it's likely that you'll say, oh, bikinis, they're terrible or, you know, or somebody from a minority group behaves badly. Oh, you know, these type of people are like this when it's actually just an individual. So we have to be very careful there. Are there any thoughts or questions on that? I'm kind of curious as to how many people here have had a lot of contact with monastics and these kind of uh, dynamics. It's, um, even if you haven't, I think it's interesting because sometimes we can elevate people to almost superhuman states uh, and project all kinds of things onto uh, those in robes, uh, especially probably the bhikkhu sangha, the, the male sangha. You know, I think there's something about um, older men as well and maybe the height and the sort of gravitas that some monks can have and you just think gosh they must know so much they must be it's internalized patriarchy I've seen it in myself you know we just assume that somebody's older somebody's I don't know has a deep voice and they must be very wise sometimes they've just ordained you know <laughs> um and we're on the path I mean, the vast, vast majority of monastics, okay, we're committed. There's a level of renunciation that lay people don't have, usually. Um, and ideally, of course, because some monastics may be bad, may be crooked. But um, but that's but we're still on the path. Very, very few people have actually realized their potential at this stage. So we have to support one another. See? Hello again. Um, so you know about the whole um about the whole like losing faith and confidence in the in the monastics. Um would there ever be like a time where um like you sort of forgive and like, oh it's it's all right, you know, we'll give you another chance kind of thing. Because like we're all human and I know like nobody's perfect, but like obviously being a monk's really hard. Yeah. I know obviously I haven't tried it myself, but like I can imagine it's quite hard in, in some circumstances. So like would it would people have another chance or would oh, the lay sangha have another chance in some respect? Absolutely. There's only a few things that um would actually mean you would have to leave the, the monastic order. 
And those are things like sexual conduct, basically, because you're a celibate monastic. That's very serious. Um, and sort of stealing over a certain amount, obviously killing a living being or even encouraging another person to kill. That's very serious as well. Um, creating a schism in the Sangha, which is defined in this book actually earlier on. So it doesn't just mean kind of having a different opinion or being in a different branch or not being part of the Wat Pong Sangha anymore. It kind of means um, having views that are contrary to the Buddhist teachings and being basically not really Buddhist at all. Um, what else? There's a few things there. Um, for Bhikkhunis, there's a little bit more involved with the sexual misconduct, but Again, you know, it's subject to um, study <laughs> and interpretation, but it's kind of anything that would, um, yeah, lead to a major loss of faith and that would be considered completely inappropriate for a monastic. The other kind yeah. of things that we have are usually based on just acknowledging the mistake or sometimes forfeiting things that uh, we've taken when we shouldn't have done. Little things, you know. Like um, you've kept your allowables too long or you've kept an extra robe, then you have to give it back. I just wanted to say um, Merry Christmas to everyone here. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. <laughs> so, yeah, monastics are not expected to be perfect. I mean, otherwise there'd be no point ordaining, would there? If you're perfect already, I mean, would you need to ordain? No, probably not. <laughs> so these are any extreme cases. And I think it has to be taken sort of quite literally here that it is referring to these particular things. Um, but, you know, there are cases when there might be anyone in a community, a monastic or a lay person, and there's so much division and divisiveness, you know, and it brings around so much disharmony that you really do have to ask them to leave. And after a while, it's not that they'd be asked to leave the Sangha necessarily because it's not a disrobal offence, but they might get a bit of a reputation and they might find it hard to settle anywhere um and so yeah sometimes we have to know what kind of things can be repaired what kind of things can be improved and when there's something else going on like maybe a personality disorder or some kind of trauma that's um you know causing a person to act a certain way um or yeah whatever else that might be best addressed um professionally and maybe the sangha is not the best place for that person at that time it doesn't mean they can't have another go another time. So, yeah, it's a very, very forgiving path. And, uh, I mean, forgiveness is the heart of all religion, isn't it? Even non-religion, I think, forgiveness is... Uh, and forgiveness to ourself, you know? Because sometimes we can... I mean, there's been cases where, say, a monastic will leave because they feel so terrible about some minor offence and, and no one can talk them out of it. I think Ajahn Bram told me about somebody like that. And I heard... I actually heard it in a Q&A with him when he was a, a monastic in the like many, many years ago, decades ago. And he kept talking about remorse and regret and and what to do. And Ajahn Ram kept saying, well, you just, you know, tell the Sangha. And then if the Sangha say, OK, just do better next time, just accept that. You don't have to be punished, you know. This isn't the Anagarika who ate the sandwich in the afternoon. This is a monk because um, the Anagarika who ate the sandwich also felt terrible and wanted a punishment. But, yeah. This was like, you can get pedantic. And I've seen that, especially in younger monastics, so much pedanticness around things which aren't even necessarily ethically wrong. Um, and it can drive a person mad. And I think it's partly due to a fault-finding mind and maybe a lot of guilt, a lot of, um, you know, uh, maybe also some trauma. I don't know the way they've been um, conditioned to, to really find fault with themselves. Um, and that's very sad because it's almost as though we have to learn to forgive and move on in order to really succeed. And I think you're right, Susie, in that way, that it is hard and there is a lot of, you know, attention on you in a way. I mean, I try to project it away from me by kind of acting more relaxed because I don't want people to kind of put me on a pedestal in any way. Um, so, yeah, if we don't find a way to be ourselves and to be honest and to be fallible really um i think that's when it doesn't tend to work if you're coming to monastic life to fix yourself this delusion of a self that's also not going to work because there is no self and it's not about fixing or making ourselves something different or better it's about understanding conditioning 
and trying to move in a way that conditions us towards wholesome states. So, yeah. And then the practice can be very beautiful, very um, easeful in a way, because we can rejoice in the, in the little steps we take. Yeah. Anything else? I wonder if you have anything. Because I tend to look only at the screen. Nothing? Okay. All right. So we're going to get through a third paragraph today. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> Sometimes we, we get only through about one. It just depends how uh, chatty people feel. <clears throat> ah. So here we go. This is answering your question as well, Susie. Reconciliation, and this is from the same passage in the Angatura. This is the next one, Angatura 8, number 89. Monastics, when a monastic possesses eight qualities, the Sangha, if it wishes, may enjoin an act of reconciliation on him or them. What eight? Ah, is this reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Now I'm not sure what reconciliation means. Okay, you can help me out here. Uh, they try to prevent lay people from acquiring gains. So it's the same eight. They try to bring harm, they insult and revile, they divide, they speak dispraise of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and they do not fulfill a legitimate promise to lay people. So that's another one. When a monastic possesses these eight qualities, the Sangha, if it wishes, may enjoin an act of reconciliation on them. Hmm. Doesn't reconciliation mean they allow them back in? I'm not quite sure here. I'll keep reading. Monastics, when a monastic possesses eight qualities, the Sangha, if it wishes, may revoke an act of reconciliation previously imposed on them. What eight? They did not try to prevent lay people acquiring gains or bring harm or insult and revile or divide lay people from one another. They speak praise of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and fulfill a, legit a legitimate promise to lay people. When a monastic possesses these eight qualities, the Sangha, if it wishes, may revoke an act of reconciliation previously imposed on them. So this must be the opposite of how it sounds. Hmm. Yeah? Any thoughts or comments or questions from anyone else in the room? Liz. <laughs> Liz? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, to to uh, work his way through the problem, and reconciliate with the lay people. I think that's what it means. I might be wrong. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that could be the case. So it's like a kind of a process that they're undergoing. Mm -hmm. And once it's fulfilled, it's revoked. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I'll come to Leon next. I'm not sure if I should be unmuting or one of the co-hosts is doing it. Can you unmute? I'll send you a message. I'm not sure. Still not? Uh, okay, yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Venerable. Um, hi. Yeah, hi. You know, I, I, I just... <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm in a different time zone now. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to be here. I've just been thinking a lot about um, how it seems like in the world, um, for many people, I think our idea of justice is usually tied to some idea of like punishment, mm. right? I think that a lot of times what I see, especially with a lot of conflicts going on in the world right now, is that um, people often feel that when something has been done that's wrong, there's a price that they have to extract from the wrongdoer, that the person has to the person who did the wrong act has to be made to suffer to some amount yeah. in order to like gain, I, I don't know what, to gain some kind of restoration. Yeah. Um, and I was just thinking a lot about how, as far as I can tell, in the entire Pali Canon, the Buddha never uh, 
advocates for that. He never advocates for like uh, extracting punishment from people. Um, yeah. Even in the Angula Masuta, he never he encounters like the worst, uh, the worst of the worst in human behavior, and he never says like this, you, you've done something wrong. Now you must be punished for it. So it, it's just interesting for me to note that even when we're talking about monastics uh, or lay people behaving badly and needing to be corrected, it never seems like the the Buddha is telling us to extract a price from them. That's really what true. they've done. Thank you so much for making that point. I think you're absolutely spot on, and I think um, you know the main reason for that is because often when a person does wrong. They're doing it because they suffer. They already suffer. And if they don't, they certainly will once they've done that wrong. So making them suffer more is just going to increase that cycle. It's just going to keep that cycle going on and on and on, isn't it? I mean, we know it doesn't work. You know, the penal systems we have don't work. We talked about that on the meta retreat that I, I taught in Devon recently. Um, what people really need is... Uh, yeah, reparation. They need they need support. They need maybe counselling, or they need a sense of belonging. They need to be able to feel like valuable members of a community again. They need trust. I mean, of course, there are cases where people might have to be restrained. They might have to be taken away from society for a while, but it should be with the intention to bring them back into society as good and members who can contribute in a meaningful way not just to punish for the sake of punishment. But I think this is coming because, you know, human beings generally, unless we've worked on ourselves a lot, um, still have anger, still have hate and hold on to a lot of resentment. You know, um, I mean, I've seen in myself sort of getting quite upset or getting kind of shocked by some of the behaviours you see in the world. You know, <gasps> how can it happen? How could they do that? You know? Of course, it doesn't go in my case to wanting to harm that person, but sometimes it comes up, you know, and we forget that, yeah, that person is the first victim, actually, of their own behavior. I mean, they're making terrible karma. They're not only causing immense harm to another person, but they're causing themselves to have terrible rebirth. I mean, if you believe in that or not, they're certainly not going to have a happy next moment, you know. Uh, or a clear conscience, or a peaceful sleep. You can see that in the eyes of some of these, um, even world leaders, no names mentioned. There's a deadness there, you know. There's a there's a severe lack of happiness there. There's no real chance for them to find peace unless they do change. So I completely agree. The Buddha never talks about punishment. He brings people in. I mean, with the case of Angulimala that you um, mentioned, for people that don't know, this was a person who was um, I can't, kind of brainwashed, I think, by his own teacher who who he had a lot of respect and faith in. And that teacher was a rogue and told him to go out and kill um, a thousand people and take the little finger and wear it around his neck. So he went out and killed like 999, as the fable goes. It means a lot of people, right? It might not be really literal. And he would wear them around his neck. And Anguli means like finger. Mala means necklace. So that's why he was called Anguli Mala. Um, and so he was a murderer, mass murderer, or at least murders were things he'd done. And when he met the Buddha, the Buddha, um, he actually went out to meet the Buddha to kill him and make him the hundredth person, uh, the hundredth victim of his uh, of his terrible deeds. Um, but instead, the Buddha... Uh, went towards him he knew what was happening and he started using psychic powers to walk really really fast faster than Angulimala could keep up with him so he, even though he looked as if he was walking norm normally he was going really really fast and Angulimala shouted after the Buddha stop recluse stop and all the Buddha had to do was turn around and say I've stopped Angulimala you stop and Angulimala of course thought what What's he, what's he talking about? But something clicked. And from that moment, he changed his ways. And he became a great arahat. He became fully enlightened, which is an, an incredible story. And there are even suttas about him and uh, uh, chantings, Angulimala chantings, which are like um, blessings for pregnant women because he became uh, like a kind of, what would you call? I mean, not the midwife, obviously, but sort of a, a guardian of pregnant women. Like he'd be there blessing their childbirth. 
Um, so he was really keen to promote life, in other words, instead of uh, um, continue his old ways. And yet still he did have people who were his enemies, people whose families he'd killed and um, family members he'd killed. And he did get um, stoned and beaten and he just considered, okay, this is because what I've done in the past, but I'm not going to go into hate. He didn't have any hate left in his heart, so he just wished them well. So people were out to punish him, but in, in fact, in the end, the punishment only landed on them. It didn't even touch this Arahat. So, yeah. Very interesting point. Can we go to Kedwin now? It'd be nice to hear from you. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Venerable. Um, Angulimala is like one of my favorite stories from the suttas, mm. I think, because Angulimala gives me hope yeah. that we can all become arahants. Like if a mass murderer, like I've never murdered anyone. So, okay. you know, if a mass murderer can can uh, uh, become an arahant, then it's attainable uh, to anyone, I think. Mm. And um, I just wanted to, so I really appreciate the comment about justice. And um, uh, mm. I was thinking about, um, so uh, the, the retreat centers in the U.S. Um, where uh, some of the bhikkhunis teach um, have uh, like they're very very expensive to go to, and um, they're out of my reach mm. for the most part. Um, and so, like in terms of social justice issues, like I don't think they're there with social justice mm. issues. Mm. Um, and you really have to have a lot of money to go to retreat centers, and um, and so I've really been. Uh, struggling with this lately because like I want access to the bikunis um this retreat center which you are going to and several other bikunis are going to in 2024 and um I was told that I'm allowed one scholarship per year to go and so it's like there's four bikunis I have to choose which bikuni <laughs> I get to see um yeah <laughs> it's very painful for me and oh. it's a bigger issue too because one of the things I've noticed in the Western, uh, you know, retreat centers um, is often I feel like I don't belong there. Like they'll say, oh, everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. And, but I don't feel welcome. Mm. You know, like I feel like I'm an outsider because I don't, I have barely any money and um, I live on a very, very, very tiny income, mm. like just enough to cover my basic expenses. Yeah. And, um, and so like, I feel like you're welcome here as long as you have money, you know, yeah. if you have enough money to pay, then you can, you can come as much as you want. Mm. Um, and so that's just something that I've been struggling with. And I thought I, yeah, I thought I'd just bring it up because yeah. it's a, you no, know, yeah. 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 I can understand that that might feel, um, very painful. And exclusive, yeah. I'm glad they're giving you one bursary because <laughs> I guess four bikinis is pretty incredible, isn't it? Like four in one place, yeah. I mean, I have no idea how things work in that center. I, I do appreciate that they want to support bikinis to give us a chance to teach, but hopefully, they can record everything at the very least. I mean, this is what we try to do because sometimes there are very real costs for these centers, and I hope they can be honest with that. and you know, give as much as they really can. Um, yeah, because there's no need to make profits in in places that are set up for retreat. I mean, over and above, you know, the actual cost of the retreat. So hopefully there can be some kind of program whereby people who have more can give more and that giving more can go for those who have less. This is the ideal. I mean, the most beautiful example of centres that I've seen is the Goenka centres. And unfortunately, if you don't really get on with that technique, it's very limited. But if that is a good technique for you and you're able to stay within that box, um, it's very beautiful because all the centres run on a donation basis and nobody's paid even to serve there. Everyone serves freely. Um, I think there's one centre that's the exception in India, like because there's 500 people on every retreat. And they have a, a couple of paid kitchen staff and that's it. 
Um, but really what it means is that those with more can basically, yeah, cover those people who barely have anything. And there are many, many people who come from illiterate villages, you know, there's hardly any donations for those retreats, but the donations of the wealthier people help. So I suppose my encouragement to people would be to like give more if you can, you know, especially if there is such a bursary system in a, in a retreat center, um, just give more recognizing that some people do have um limited means everybody does right i mean it's just different degrees um yeah and also for us as well we also have bursaries um maybe we have to make it more available on the web more obvious on the website we're trying to kind of upgrade but you know if people can put something in those uh, bursaries it's also very helpful and of course i mean for monastics ideally we teach as much as we can um on a donation basis like all of these you know Online things are on a donation basis, but sometimes, unfortunately, because it's a patriarchal system and we don't get as much support from, we don't have any branch monasteries, like head monasteries that like trickle money down to us. That means we do have to cover our expenses. And, um, you know, sometimes we have to hire a retreat center. Over here, it's like 40,000 to hire this particular place we did out in Bramali's retreat. And I, I just can't almost justify it because because it keeps people out. You know, the people who can pay, it's good, and the people that can't feel sad. So do you do it anyway? It's really an ethical question for me. And I have a feeling we're going to do it online again next year so we can put the prices down and, you know, whatever does come in goes to the bikinis rather than the retreat centre. Yeah, so that's really tough. I um, hope that you can choose a retreat that gives you so much nourishment and so much, uh, yeah, to work with you know, and that you can really apply in your life. Thanks for raising it. I'm just going to see if anybody else wants to ask because um, I just want to give everybody a chance or, or comment in any way. Otherwise, I'll come to... Did you want to say something else to that, Kedwin, before we finish? Because your hand's still raised. Did you want to say anything? Thank you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say I want to encourage the Western retreat centers to move to the more Goenka style where they're asking people to, you know, give Donna uh, so that the retreat centers can continue. And my understanding is they do quite well. Okay. Mm -hmm. That they have plenty of money. Right. And I think it's a yeah. I think it's a trust issue. Right. Like they're in a capitalist system and they don't trust okay. that there's going to be enough they for everyone. Really do have and they're people. much more diverse, <clears throat> the going centers that or the Goenka center that I went to was much more diverse oh. in terms of economic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what you want to be seeing. Yeah. Excellent. That's a good, yeah. good sign. Yeah. 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 yeah that's a shame. Okay. So Thank you. Thank you, Kedwin. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, so like what came in what came into my mind just recently was when you were talking about An Angula Mala. Angula Mala. Mm -hmm. Um, and the whole like forgiving, you know, monastics and like viewing the um lay people. It's like, um, how fortunate are we to like know each other and like be able to practice the come together and practice the dharma um even when we do make our own mistakes like like Angul Angulimala made a very very terrible um mistakes and he still became an arahant it's very mm -hmm. it's a very beautiful story um yeah. so I just want to express my gratitude for yeah. like the Buddha Dharma and Sangha like everyone coming together and like mm. um helping support that that dream Thank you. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we can, you know, take different lessons from that. One of them is that, gosh, if he can do this, then, yeah, we can too. If the Buddha can forgive that, we can surely forgive ourselves for shouting at our mom or whatever we've done, you know. Um, but another thing to uh, to see it as is like, yes, you can rejoice in what you've not done, you know. You don't have to only say I've done great things today and that, and therefore I can be happy. You can be happy because you've not done those things. And I think if we just bring that up, you know, recognizing all the things we could have done, the mistakes we could have made and, you know, the ways we could have been much more unskillful, 
that's very positive because we're so likely we're much more likely to find fault with all the things we don't do perfectly than actually look at the things we we haven't done the things we've restrained from doing and the buddha says you know bring that up bring that up in your mind recognize you're free you've got a good conscience you know there's nothing holding you back unless you've killed is it killed your mother or father raped a bikini drawn the blood of an arahat, hat or created a genuine schism in the sangha means really breaking up the, the monastic sangha then you can be enlightened if you hear the teachings of the buddha develop confidence in the teachings and put them into practice and don't give up you know if you stop a little bit here and stop for a while there don't that's okay you can come back but basically i like that phrase bikkhu bodhi said it there's only two things you need for enlightenment start walking on the path number one and continue number two that's it <laughs> so the fact that we've started the fact that we're starting to hear the dhamma we're starting to get some confidence it's resonating for us it means something to us this is already enormous you know even if you don't think you know much it, it doesn't matter it's like you say just coming together with good people to support each other and you know accept that we're we're just trying our best I think that's the real difference for me that differentiates practitioners from maybe those who haven't begun is that at least we're trying you know, I mean, people that haven't begun on this Buddhist path are also usually trying, but I think the Buddhist path helps us to take responsibility for our suffering, to take more responsibility for our actions, for, you know, our negativity and start to learn not to blame things outside. So this is really a massive blessing because, you know, if you're blaming things outside, I mean, sometimes it might seem that it's things outside causing our suffering and certainly we shouldn't abstain from trying to fix those things up. But eventually, you know, it's um, happiness is an inside job. It just is. You know, happiness comes from things inside. It comes from qualities of the heart. It comes from happinesses that are more mind created than physical comfort. Um, and this is not to say we don't need, obviously, safety, shelter and all those basic requisites that goes for monastics, that goes for everybody here. But yeah, if you have the teachings of the Buddha, you're doing really, really well. And uh, even if you have a place to stay, some enough food to eat, you're already probably in the top, I don't know, 5% in this world. So try to make use of what you've got. And you can always have a home retreat as well. This is also possible. I mean, I know that also depends on economics because you might have to be at work. But sometimes we can just, you know, try to notice where you do have a bit more time than you're really honest about having. I have to do it too, you know. I can say, well, I'm busy all day long and, you know, I have to work and I have to do this and I have to do that. But I can take half an hour here and there for a rest to meditate a little bit, you know, or to listen to a Dhamma talk and just set my mind on track. We can all do that. And there's so much out there on the internet. I mean, this is really a mecca of Dhamma these days. There's nothing like this in my youth. I had to go to India for that. I had to live very basically and uh, take a lot of risks. And I wouldn't, I don't regret any of it. But now it's so easily available. We're so fortunate, really, really, aren't we? So I feel very fortunate to be able to share with a lovely group. And um, But now I think we will have to wind up very soon um, because we're coming to the end of the session. And um, just to remind you that this is the last session until the end of January. I think I had put down for one in the beginning of the month, but to be honest, I'm seeing my best friend who I haven't seen properly for the whole year, really. Uh, I think I saw it at one volunteer meeting. So we're having a few days together, and I thought, you know what? I'm not going to ask her, do you mind if I do a Zoom? We're just going to have some time together, and um, I'll be back, I think, on the is it 23rd? Somewhere around the 23rd of Jan. Um, but tomorrow we have the meta meditation for those in the right time zone. I think Joe's coming anyway, even though he's not really in the right time zone. <laughs> but it's always the right time for meta. So that's at 9 a.m. UK time tomorrow morning. And uh, the next one of those is also towards the end of Jan. Um, for those who are interested in our project and the fact that we did just put an offer and have an offer accepted on a bigger property, there is a meeting on the 13th of January, UK time. Uh, sorry for those who really will be fast asleep. It's at 9 a.m. till 11 a.m. on Saturday, the 13th of January. 
Uh, in the newsletter, I've given you a link, but I think I'm going to have to redo that because we're going to make it a registration event simply so that we can have people who do know a bit about the project and can contribute in a meaningful way. Otherwise, it will be a lot of time spent on explaining what we're doing and why. <laughs> and we really want it to be more like bringing people together to figure out how we can work as a community to make this really succeed. And there's going to be a very special guest. I would say a special guest for anyone else. So that gives you a hint. <laughs> I mean, everyone's special, but this is, you know, V with a capital V in my book. Uh, <laughs> so please look out for another little bulletin. It will be just like a paragraph in a newsletter to say that you need to follow a registration link for that. Um, and we'll see you there. But hopefully tomorrow I'll have um, some of you in the meta session too. So, oh, did Monori want to say a few words as well? Um, I think, yeah, you kind of touched it, but then just to remind that all these, you know, teachings are uh, given to you on donation basis in the spirit of generosity. So uh, if you have any means, um, um, please, um, um, you know, donate generously. And when you do these retreats and book things, there's always a tick for um uh, bursaries as well so sometimes you wouldn't think about them but then you know now you know that you know there are people who want to join and uh, you know we need to uh, look after the whole of the community and it is such a good uh, act to do that so uh, so please be aware of that little tick as well and uh uh, and also um, when we were touched on the property and uh, so we are at this moment doing all the all the things like surveys and uh, a little bit delayed because of the Christmas but there's a lot of uh, work going uh, behind and uh, then once we acquired you know that so there's cost build up for those as well a lot of payments going in for different things uh, so this is a time that you can uh, you can, uh, you know, get together and uh, be part of the new Vihara uh, because uh, it is it is going to, you know, serve a lot more people. It is going to train your bhikkhunis and uh, it will be there for generations. <laughs> it has a lot of space and, uh, you know, capacity to uh, grow from there. Uh, so this is, I feel, it is a very nice time to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, be a part of it, and uh, so all your whatever your donations are, you know, welcome even a small donation. And uh, when we move there, it will be uh, not me <laughs> when the Vihara moves there. <laughs> it will be um, uh, the our the normal overhead cost will be um, much more higher than the smaller place because at the moment it is a smaller place. That is why. Uh, it has to move into a bigger uh, capacity place. So we are looking to um, increase our standing orders as well. Even a little bit of money a month would be kind of add up everything would be a great, um, uh, you know, contribution towards upkeep of the monastery. So I thought I'll remind that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manoni. Yeah. This is the beauty of a project like this. And that hopefully that is what makes the difference with a monastery and a retreat center that, you know, everybody donates what they can. Everybody contributes what they can, whether it's time, whether it's skills or, you know, however you want to support. And, um, you know, it's not necessary and it's not possible that one or two or even 100 people do this off their own back. This is thousands of people. We have thousands of people listening to these talks. We have thousands of people on our YouTube and, you know, on our Facebook pages and all of this so it's very lovely that everyone can be involved in some way and um, yeah also I'm teaching a new year retreat as I mentioned for Sheffield Insights so if you want to go on Sheffield Insights um, website you can sign up for one or two or three of those days uh, you could come in person if you wish but then you have to find somewhere to sleep in Sheffield because it's non-residential and uh, what else I think that's everything, isn't it, for now? So we'll see you hopefully for Meta and also on the 13th. Yeah. 
And if you're not signed up to our newsletter, maybe do that, or at least look on the website for the joining link for the 13th, if you're interested. So do take care and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you soon.